This is Unbreakable Hope. It's great to have you here. I'm John Bradshaw, and in this series, we've been looking at stories of unbreakable hope. If you're like most people, there've been times that you've looked at what another person is going through and you've thought to yourself, I could never, I could never cope with that. I could never handle that. I could never go through that. And that's an understandable thought. Few people know what lies ahead in life and very few people get the opportunity to plan for life's challenges. You couldn't have known that accident was going to happen. There was no way you could have known that you're gonna lose a limb or that your house was gonna burn down. A cancer diagnosis usually comes from out of the blue. Now, when you combine a tragedy or a real difficult trial with faith, it's common you get the usual answers or responses, and they're the right answers, really. Well, God has said He will never leave you or forsake you, so you can know that God is with you right now, okay? True, but that doesn't take away the pain a person is feeling. Romans 8:28. all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. And that's true, right? From a faith perspective, all things do work together for good. Now, we know that that doesn't mean that all things are good. A cyclone isn't good. A flood isn't good. Having your house broken into isn't good. But the Bible says that all things work together for good. Nothing surprises God. Nothing frustrates God's purposes. And God is able to bring something wonderful out of any situation when a person trusts God. So that's true, and we believe that. But put yourself in the place of a person who's just gone through or is going through some excruciatingly difficult challenge. Your 45-year-old spouse is diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. And then somebody tells you that all things work together for good. Even if you believe that, and you should, those words could sound hollow. Your mother dies and all things work together for good. Your business is tanking. You're working 16 hour days. You've borrowed money. You've borrowed, you've borrowed more money than you might've wanted to. You've done everything you can possibly think of to stop the bleeding, but you realize there's nothing you can do and everything you've worked so long for is about to go right down the drain. At a time like that, be still and know that I am God can be hard to hear. Now, none of those sentiments are inaccurate or inappropriate. It's true that God will never leave you or forsake you. It's true that all things work together for good. It's true that you can be still and know that God is God. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Now, those words written by James are absolutely true. Now that makes it sound as though going through a trial is absolutely the best thing that could ever happen to you. But the reality is, even though God is with you, even though you can be still and know that He is God, even though that all things work together for good, even though you may count it all joy when temptation strikes and, and the trying of your faith really does produce patience, the fact is that often you're just struggling to cope, struggling to make it from day to day. Life can be brutal. And faith in God doesn't make the murder of your sister or the loss of your life savings any less real. So how do you go about coping with one of those life-changing events that turn your world and maybe the world of a whole lot of other people upside down? Now, people do it. They do it because they have to. They do it because there's still so much to live for. But while I'm saying that, let's be honest. Some people don't make it. Some people simply aren't able to handle major trauma. Some people fall apart. He was never the same after this certain thing happened. Ever since that day, she's never been the same person. That happens again and again, and it's tragic. And there has to be a way, surely, that a person can be confronted by a major devastating life event and still be able to go forward in a healthy way. Now, faith in God was never designed to make the harsh realities of life less real. Faith in God is not a cliche. It's not some kind of magic wand that you wave to make all things sweetness and light. In the book of Revelation, Jesus addresses the church of Smyrna and he says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Notice what he said you're about to suffer. Some of you will be imprisoned. You will be tested. You'll undergo tribulation. 
Jesus says, I'll give you the crown of life, which is wonderful. But at the same time, he says, be faithful to death. Some of them are going to die, even though they had faith in God. Jesus was assuring them of that. And for every person who would die, there'd be parents or children or a spouse or friends left to deal with the trauma of horrific loss. I don't know where on the hierarchy of pain, suffering and loss you'd put it, but surely losing a child would have to be somewhere near the very top. Adrian Webster knows something from firsthand experience about losing a child. He's a Christian today. In fact, he's a minister of the gospel. I wanted to see what we could learn from Adrian's experience. I wanted to find out how a person can endure immense loss and how in spite of going through a terribly difficult experience, people can move forward in life healthy, happy, and whole. Adrian Webster, thank you very much for taking your time. I appreciate it. Fantastic to be here. Hey, take me back a little bit. Let, let's start with you telling me a little about your background. Well, um, I came to New Zealand uh, New Year's Day 2010. Came with a family, my wife and three children at the time. So we came over to New Zealand and started a new life here. And it wasn't too long after that when we decided we would grow the family, decided we wanted to have another child. Okay, and things happened just like they were supposed to un <laughs> un until they didn't. Yeah, yeah, well, so, so tell me about that. Uh, getting pregnant wasn't the problem. That happened without a, without a hitch, but it wasn't long before we realized that uh, we were gonna have twins and uh, they were gonna be identical twins on top of that. So it was going to be identical twin boys. Uh, but my wife started to suffer from what we now know are placental abruptions, where, the, where, 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 uh, where bleeding occurs and really is the precursor to a miscarriage. Mm. And uh, at 23 odd weeks, she landed up in hospital because it was that bad. And uh, we were told back then that they only really intervene here by about 24 weeks at the earliest. And so if it's anything before that, they were just gonna let nature take its course, which was of course a very, very bitter pill for us to swallow. Nature taking its course would have meant? Miscarriage. Times two. Correct. While she was in hospital in that period, uh, she managed to uh, hang on. And until there was another big bleed, and that was 23 plus six. Mm -hmm. And so, so the doctors looked at that and they went, that's close enough to the, the, the margin of error, and therefore they were going to intervene. And so she was helicoptered from where we were living in Whangarei down to the Auckland City Hospital. And, uh, and they did everything that they could to make sure that she was rested, that the pregnancy would go to full term. Uh, but about 27 weeks, uh, there was another, another incident and they decided that um, they needed to perform a medical intervention. So they, so they did a, an emergency caesarean and, and delivered the two boys. Okay, so good news. You're at 27 weeks, you have two baby boys. Yep. And, and super excited. Family's thrilled. You know, we've been told that um, with mod modern technologies and so on, of course the doctors didn't give us 100% assurance, but sure. you know, high probability that she's made it to 27 weeks, usually after that, there's, there's good survival rates, good, you know, um, outcomes. And so we were kind of like, oh, okay, so we get, to, we get to fast forward the pregnancy bit and go straight to the kids, you know? Yeah. But it wasn't all right. And how, did you, how, did you, how were you made aware of that? One of those midnight phone calls on night number one. And so I got the call and the call was that uh, you need to come up now because we're not sure that one of the boys is gonna make it. And so, yeah, so obviously bounced out of bed, shot up to the hospital room. By the time I got there, uh, my wife was of course the, the specialist uh, who was overseeing the situation, had managed to get it all under control. And so, so he made it through the night. There's a second question to follow. What goes through the mind of a dad when you get that phone call and the news is your little infant that you've and after this, after this process, after these battles, after the highs and the lows and the real lows, get through all of that, you have two, two brand new children, you get the phone call saying, come quickly because. Well, I think for us, 
the, the thing is, we thought we had finished the fight. Yeah. You know, we'd gotten to a point, you know, 27 weeks, we'd gotten to the point where apparently now there were good outcomes. Yeah. And so when you get that call, um, it's like a shot out of the blue. And you get up there and you find this room full of top-notch professionals and you realize something's been going on here. And you can see the expressions on the face. You can see they're tired. They've obviously been doing this for a while before they gave us the call, you know. And so um, yeah, it's a bit of a wake-up call and you go, oh, this is serious. This is, this is, this is, yeah, this is. That second question is, what goes through a mother's mind? She's just had a caesarean, like right. she's physically drained, she's yeah. physically exhausted and injured, <laughs> you know, and so it was, she was, de she was devastated, you know, she, she was scared, um, emotional, uh, it was traumatic to say the least. So walk me through what happens when you get to the room, you, you see the, the white coats and some grave looking, highly trained medical professionals, what played out? Well, um, they said to us, look, it's all right. It, it looks like uh, Judah has stabilized. So the, the two boys, Joshua and Judah, so the pediatric specialist said to me at the time, she's just concerned that sometimes when they've had to do the things that they've done tonight, it doesn't always go well later on. What is your faith saying to you at this point of the experience? Well, obviously, you know, through this whole thing we've been praying together we've been praying over the unborn twins now we're praying at the at the um, you know the ICU cubicle that the, that the child is in you know begging the Lord for an extension a miracle I, I want a miracle that's the bottom line sure. and you believed it was possible oh, 100% yeah. 100% we're talking about the God who speaks worlds into existence yes. who raises the dead we're talking about Jesus who came out of the tomb so tell me what happened uh, over the coming days, we expected and we hoped that uh, his lungs would get stronger. So the real problem, they call it chronic lung disease. And so uh, while Joshua, you know, made progress, Judah required more and more ventilation. Yeah, it, it, it just continued to deteriorate when it should be you know, going in the other direction, um, where it should be getting stronger and more independent over time, you know. Tell me about the conversations you and your wife might have been having with God during this time. My wife spent most of the time in the hospital with the boys. I had the other kids that I was looking after. We were staying in the Ronald McDonald house, as I said. So I would some, I'd escape from the hospital. I'd go out to a park next door to the hospital. They had some nice ponds. I'd spend a bit of time out there just reflecting and praying. Did a lot of heart searching, you know, starting to ask questions like, you know, is the miracle being withheld because I am not what I should be as a Christian because I haven't been as faithful as I ought to be. You know, you start to play those games with yourself, um, trying to make sure I've confessed all my sins, gone through the list, you know. Uh, yeah, just, uh, just wanting to make sure I'm not somehow a roadblock for the very prayer that I'm, you know, asking for fulfillment in, you know. Was it, was it, a, was it, a, was it constant progress? Were there ups and downs? Were there downs and downs? Were there ups and ups? Yeah, there were some times when you, you, we, we left the room elated, you know, just it was a great day. It's, you know, it just looks, they had to dial the pressure down on the ventilator, you know, things are looking good. And then you'd come back the next day and it'd be worse than it was the day before, you know, and, uh, and you think, oh, wow. You know, so you'd have maybe a, two or three days and then you'd have just fall off the cliff again and uh, back to square one it's or gotta worse. It's got to be exhausting. Yeah, it was very exhausting and especially for my wife, sure. yeah. The doctors started calling us aside and having hard conversations saying, look, this is going on for too long. Usually when we see this, it's not a good sign. We think that probably, you know, we're gonna have to start thinking about an end game here. Um, and of course, at first we were angry how dare they even suggest that after we've come so far, you know. Uh, God's not going to let that happen, you know. Um, and, and they started to encourage us to think, you know, obviously they're always saying, you know, you need to be thinking of the child and the one who's, who's suffering, right? You can't hang on because of your own desire to avoid loss. Anyway, so we, um, we they, they started having these conversations with us every few days and it, that, that really was traumatic. Um, and then, then the, and we were just like, no, we don't want to bar that. No, no, we're not going to do that. And then we had a day with Judah. This was the last day. 
and uh, we had a, a photographer, we didn't know it was the last day, but um, a photographer came in and offered one of those people in the community of faith, hey, let me get some family portraits of you guys, you know, and so we did. So we, we, we did all of that, again, not knowing it was the last day. And so we got some beautiful photos. But it became evident to us after, you know, the denial and no, we're not going to do that and whatever. We saw him go through a very rapid decline in that 24 hour period. And we just, we just got the sense that it wasn't fair anymore for us to you know, artificially be sustaining his physical life uh, when he was honestly just just suffering, just in pain. You could see he, was in, he wasn't just not breathing properly, he was, he was in pain. So the two of you had some difficult decisions to make? S so we ended up having to make that call, yeah. What's that like? Yeah, uh, it's not a decision you ever want to have to make, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd have to say there, are, there were moments where you go like, did we give up too soon? Did we, you know, and then you stop and you think about what you experience and you go, we just, we couldn't do it to him anymore. It's because you're a Christian, you're a Christian minister, you have faith in God, you've seen God work miracles in, in, in your own experience. You've seen God work miracles in your congregation and the lives of others, you've seen it. No sweat for God to work a miracle now, but he didn't. And you are left to pick up the pieces of that, you, your wife, your family. Explore that with me. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, like, what kind of a pastor I, am I if I if I can't even get God to work me a miracle? You know, um, am I the guy you want praying for you? You know. Oh, um, sure. See how complicated this gets. Yeah, and uh, and uh, w was it my fault somehow? As I said before, you know, maybe maybe I'm not legit with God. You know, those those thoughts came. And then the temptation comes where you're going, well, um, good God, bad world, maybe maybe not so good God. I don't know what, what's going on. An obvious answer, right? Um, on top of that, you get the well-meaning people that have inferences and they say things that are not always helpful, you know. You get, you get the people that sort of want to imply that maybe, maybe your life isn't the way it should be. Um, that, that maybe, um, you know, God didn't give you the miracle you were looking for because you weren't right. When I had those questions and when I had those doubts, I was able to rebuff them and say, but that's not what the Word of God says. Mm. But we do live by grace through faith. So it's not about my performance. It's not, this didn't happen because of my insufficiencies or whatever. Uh, we understand that sin has corrupted the very genetic code and so things go wrong on a physiological level that have nothing to do with who sinned. And the temptation is we want to blame God. Did you? No. Not at any time? I didn't. Because that's what, that's what everybody is wondering right now. Did you get angry with God? I mean, I, I would say you go through those emotions, you know, you, you kind of, kind of, yeah. I can't say, I can't say, but it was never sustained in the sense that when I allowed myself to be informed by the Word of God, when I thought through it carefully, no, I can't blame God because I understand there's this great controversy between Christ and Satan. There is an enemy as well as a, as well as a good God. So, so that temptation came? The temptation was there and I believe that's exactly what Satan wants to do with all tra tragedy. That's why he's even got the insurance companies calling natural disasters acts of God. They're not acts of God, they're the acts of the enemy. Like his, his strategy has always been to put on God the destruction that he causes. I kept coming back to that saying, look at what God has done for me, which means when my emotions don't, when my emotions are telling me I can't make sense of it, when I don't have the intellectual answers, I can at least go back to one point in history and go, I know that if God has done what he did in Jesus for me, for us, then even if I can't make sense of this event, even if I can't understand this tragedy, even if I never have an answer this side of eternity, and I still don't, I can live with that lack, knowing, being 100% confident that God loves me because look what he has done for me. I'd like you to tell me something about the, not the pain your family lives with, because you've made that evident. Tell me something about the hope your family lives with. Well, look, I mean, we obviously live in the hope of the resurrection, first and foremost, top of the list. Uh, we often will sit and think about what it might be like that one day, uh, resurrection morning, yeah. having him back in our arms. Oh, yeah. uh, we, 
We have Joshua, and he's just, as I said, just loves life, bundle of energy. And less than a year later, the Lord gave us comfort in another form because we had another baby. So you were able to come through this life-altering experience with your faith intact. What would you say to somebody who is listening to us talk and doesn't have the peace you have, is perhaps angry, angry with God, bitter, things are disintegrating rather than taking shape. How do you encourage somebody like that? I guess the challenge is, what is the filter and what is the lens, what is the matrix by which we interpret this suffering? I'm talking about really getting into the philosophy, the theology of what Scripture actually says about the origin of the world, why it's messed up, who this God is and whether he's good. Having the right worldview enables us to place these tragedies and these traumas in a context where there's hope. And so I want to challenge anybody who has experienced that brokenness and doesn't really know what to do with it and so is living in it to look for the bigger answers. You might not find the answers to the whys of your particular circumstance, but you can find great answers to the much bigger questions around meaning and, and, and life and brokenness and where we're going. And that provides the context in which the brokenness doesn't break us. And so you end up with an unbreakable hope. Outstanding. Difficult story. Thanks for sharing it. Very encouraging. I appreciate it. Thank you. Those things people often say, I'll never leave you or forsake you. All things work together for good. Be still and know that I am God. They're all true. Of course, they might not be the very best thing to say early in a conversation. The first thing most grieving or suffering people need is usually empathy or sympathy or recognition of the hardship they're enduring not reassurance from someone whose life at that moment is perfect. But it's important to know that there is a way forward. I spoke to a man once who told me that after his teenage daughter died, the only thing that got him through was the knowledge that one day he would see her again. He knew that she would rise in the resurrection at the last day, and that was a real strength to him. I've often heard people wonder out loud how people with no faith in God get through life's real challenges. In times of trial, it's strengthening to know that God says, come to me and I will give you rest. Peter wrote that God invites us to cast our cares upon God because he cares for us. The prophet wrote that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. You ever wonder why God allows these challenging, heartbreaking episodes in our lives? Well, for one thing, we live in a world of sin. Bad things happen, accidents, people die. Christians have not been promised by God an exemption from trouble. Believers in Jesus get cancer. They die in accidents. Faith in God isn't a get out of jail free card. But what God has promised is that he'll be with you in your times of trial. A time of trouble draws people closer to God. Now, you can allow trouble to drive you away from God. People do. They get angry with God, blame God for the hardships they're going through. They want nothing more to do with God. Or you could say, I know God is my friend. I know God wants the very best for me. And as difficult as this is, I know God will get me through. There's that famous story in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark writes that a great windstorm arose and the boat began to fill with water. Luke wrote that they were in jeopardy. Matthew said the ship was covered with the waves. You can imagine that this group, which contained experienced fishermen, would have been bailing out water and fighting for their lives. But then they woke up Jesus. Jesus had been asleep and they said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Well, of course he cared. Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. They were afraid. It had to be bad for men who worked on that lake for a living to fear that they were going to die. But through it all, Jesus was with them. He was right there in their midst. 
he had said to them, we are going to the other side of the lake. So, so no storm was going to stop that from happening. You can forget sometimes that Jesus is with you. Like when Peter walked on water, you'd think he'd be convinced and confident if he walked on water at Jesus' behest. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, the Bible says. And it was then that he began to sink. You don't want to forget that Jesus is with you. In the great spiritual battle in which you find yourself, there's a devil who wants you to take your eyes off Jesus. He wants you to forget God's goodness. He wants you to blame God for trials instead of running to God in the midst of trials. It can be tough sometimes, but you can always remember that God is with you and He'll get you through. And if God is with you, you can have unbreakable hope. Let me pray with you now. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that in spite of whatever comes our way, we may have unbreakable hope. Would you give us that, that quality, that faith in you, that trust in you, that no matter what happens, we believe that Jesus is our Savior and Lord and that the God of heaven is good and is for us and not against us. Keep us now, we pray, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Great to see you. See you again next time for more Unbreakable Hope. It's been an incredible journey so far with Unbreakable Hope. Over the past few weeks, we've shared stories of triumph, of resilience, and of faith from both history and the Bible. And there's more to come. After our sixth episode airs, there'll be two more special episodes. Instead of airing on television on November the 11th and November the 18th, we want to invite you to experience them in a group setting, bringing all of us together on this journey. To find the viewing location nearest to you, simply text EVENT to 5676 and we'll send you a link to locate it. We really hope to see you there, coming together in a shared vision of unbreakable hope. Text EVENT to 5676 now and let's discover together the power of unbreakable hope.